surfaces today bone dry. It was once much warmer, much wetter, much denser atmosphere, much more Earth-like. What were those conditions like? Why did an Earth-like planet get converted into this deep ice age condition that uh, Mars has, has today? And <clears throat> is there life there? Could there once have been life? Are there fossil forms? There are extraordinary, enigmatic geological features on the planet. What is their nature? There is a huge amount of exploration to do. Uh, and all of it, every step that I've described, could be before the television cameras of the world. And we could all participate in such exploration. Is it not a danger that, that the human bits that we take with us will pollute and destroy something enormously precious out there simply because we are so, so inquisitive about it? Arthur. Well, as to the question, should human beings go into, to the other planets, I think the answer to that is, well, we could have stayed in Europe and explored America by robots. It might have been, uh, it certainly saved a lot of human lives, but of course we didn't. We went there and lived in this new continent. Now, admittedly, Mars, in fact, none of the planets in the solar system is anything like as benign as the United States or the other parts of this planet, but one day people are going to call them home. There will be Martians one day, and they'll be our great-grandchildren, and they'll think it was, Earth probably is a horrible place in which to live. Now, as to whether we will pollute these environments, yes, to some extent, of course, colonization always it involves the destruction of what was there first. And I'm quite sure in the next century, in fact, already it started as a conference on the pollution of space planned in the, near, in the United States in the very near future. This is already a serious problem in near Earth space. But we have to control it. I mean, you, cut, you have to cut down forests on this Earth to make new cities. And on, on the moon, I'm afraid one day we may have to abolish much of the lunar vac vacuum. And on Mars, we may have to change the atmosphere. But I do hope we will leave, leave bits of the universe in a pristine condition. But are we also going to have to change ourselves on Mars? I mean, are we going to Mars have to evolve differently? Mars will change us. In fact, this is part of the evolutionary progress. By going out into new environments, by occupying new biological niches, that is the way we progress and discover the universe and explore the, and, and perhaps fulfill our destiny. Do you think that other planets might have uh, the same kind of system in which there would be a morality, in which there would be people taking moral attitudes, which m may not necessarily be the same as ours, of course. Well, all societies must have some moral structure. I mean, otherwise you just can't have a society. I mean, there must be understand rules, the way you behave to our neighbors. And even if the societies consist of machines, they must have a machine language so they can agree to react together. So morality in some way is essential and universal. Now, Professor Hawking, in the very last paragraph of your book, you say that if we discover a complete theory of, of the universe, then um, it should in time be understandable in broad principle to everyone and not just to a few scientists. And when that happens, all of us will be able to start discussing the why rather than the how. And I quote, if we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. Do you think that God can intervene in the universe as he wants, or is God too bound by the laws of science? The question of whether God is bound by the laws of science is a bit like your question. Can God make a stone that is so heavy that he cannot lift it? I don't think it is very useful to speculate on what God might or might not be able to do. Rather, we should examine what he actually does with the universe we live in. All our observations suggest that it operates according to well-defined laws. These laws may have been ordained by God, but it seems that he does not intervene in the universe to break the laws, at least, not once he had set the universe going. However, until recently, it was thought that the laws would necessarily break down at the beginning of the universe. 
that would have meant that God would have had complete freedom to choose how the universe began. In the last few years, however, we have realized that the laws of science may hold even at the beginning of time. In that case, God would have had no freedom. The way the universe began would be determined by the laws of science. Well, thank you very much. And Carl Sagan, in, in your introduction to the book, you commented on this. You said this is also a book about God, or perhaps about the absence of God, because Hawking left nothing for a creator to do. Now, God, of course, means many things to many people. What sort of God, basically, are we talking about when, when we talk about reading the mind of God? Well, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent question, and, uh, and I'd be most interested to, uh, to hear uh, Stephen Hawking's answer. But just, just to try to illuminate the range of possibilities, consider uh, uh, two alternatives. Uh, one is the... Uh, the uh, notion popular in the West uh, of God as a sort of outsized uh, elderly white male with a long white beard sitting in a throne in the sky and tallying the fall of every sparrow. Uh, contrast that with uh, the idea of God in the mind of, uh, let's say, Spinoza or Einstein, which was, at least very closely, the sum total of the laws of the universe. Uh, now, it would, would be madness to deny that there are uh, well-defined physical laws in the universe. And if that's what you mean by God, then there's no question that, uh, that God exists, but it's a very uh, remote uh, God, a, uh, what the French call roi faniant, uh, a do-nothing king. On the other hand, uh, the former model, the, the one who intervenes daily, uh, for that there seems to be, as Dr. Hawking said, uh, no evidence. I think it is wise, my, my own personal feeling, uh, to be uh, a little humble on, uh, on such matters. Uh, we must recognize that we are dealing with, uh, by definition, the most difficult things uh, to know the furthest from human experience. And uh, perhaps we will be able to penetrate a little way uh, into these mysteries. I think, uh, Professor Hawking, you'd like to come in here. I use God in the same sense that Einstein did. It is really the reason why the universe is as it is, and why the universe exists at all. Can I ask Arthur Clarke what he meant when you're alleged to have said to the papal nuncio, I don't believe in God, but I'm extremely interested in him? Well, I guess I haven't placed my bets yet. And, um, you know, Stephen's remarks and Carl's remarks reminded me that this was said uh, 200 years ago um, when N Napoleon, I think, was talking to Laplace, who published his theory of the universe, and uh, Napoleon said, uh, God isn't in it. And Laplace replied, Sir, I have no need for that hypothesis. Do you think that the church is, in fact, beginning to recognize that it, it may have to lose its priority, its eminence, as the sole arbiter of, of these matters, and that science will be allowed to come in as an equal partner? Well, the church is certainly, when I say, when you say the church, the Roman Catholic Church has become very much more liberal. I had the pleasure of giving a talk in the Vatican myself in the Pontifical Academy of Science quite recently and met the Pope. And, of course, they're reinstating Galileo, and so things are moving. In fact, are they moving backwards as well as 